Hey everyone, this is Kara Crossfit Brindle. Welcome back to the channel. I have Christine with us today. Hey Christine, how are you? Hi, good. How are you? Doing well. So uh, we have you on the channel before we get into our topic, which of course is family estrangement. I want people to know more about you and the amazing work you do. What would you like to share? Awesome. Um, I'm co-owner of Children's Wellness Center of Colorado. Um, we are a practice that sees children as young as three, as well as tweens, teens, and their parents and caregivers. We really take a two-generational approach to care. So we feel that children's mental health is um, impacted most when their parents are also involved with their treatment and or receiving their own therapy. Um, many of the clients that we um, are, have the privilege of serving our foster and kin care provided um, youth um, or kin cared for youth and um, all throughout the lifespan, how that touches different kids at different points in their lives. Um, and we just feel really honored to be part of their journey at the point that we are and hope that the work that we do with them will um, give them the best opportunity to live their fullest life. Amazing. Yes. So of course I want to be on the channel because I want people to know about all the amazingness that you just described. And you're one of the first people reaching out to me going, this book sounds amazing. How do I get a copy? So yeah. for viewers who haven't heard this in other videos, I put out a book on family estrangement called Penny McGee's Family Tree, talking to kids about family estrangement. So Christine, as one of my colleagues and mental health leaders in Colorado was like, hey, this sounds relevant to the population. So offline, we just talked about how this applies to foster care and kinship. Do you want to speak a little bit to how this book could be a tool for those conversations? Absolutely. I think that a lot of times, um, so the there's a big uh, focus um, now with children who are having to be removed from their biological families for issues of abuse and neglect um, to really try to put them with their other family members whenever possible. And that's referred to as kinship care. Um, and the reason is because there's a lot of research around how important it is for kids to remain with their family if they can't be with their biological parents. So that could be grandparents, it could be aunts, uncles, um, sometimes older siblings uh, who have, you know, gotten to the age that they can care for their younger siblings. But sometimes they also refer to kinship um, cared youth as just people who have been known to the youth. So it could be a teacher, a church leader, a coach, anyone who the child has had a ongoing connection with or any prior connection with. Um, and that that is obviously better. Um, when the unfortunate circumstances come up that they have to be removed from their biological parents to be with someone who's familiar, who knows them and who ultimately cares about them, um, at, you know, outside of just the the role of being their their primary caregiver during that period of time in life and or for maybe the rest of um, the time that they're needing to be uh, cared for as a child. Um, and so, and, and as mental health providers, we love this because this really helps to reduce the amount of trauma that children experience when they do have to be removed from their biological parents. And then uh, what most people think of as foster care, of course, is what a foster family that's become licensed and, um, but maybe what we call kind of a stranger to the foster mm -hmm. child prior to them being placed there. So this child's going to a new home they don't know why they're going many times. They don't know mm. what's happening. Um, and then they have to, you know, acclimate to a new environment with new people, with new rules, new food, new sleeping schedules, all everything is brand new. Um, so just imagining how it feels for some of us when we go on vacation, which is a choice, right? And we're sleeping in a different bed and we're having different food and Sometimes, you know, it causes all kinds of, um, it's like exciting and fun many times to go on vacation, but there's also an element of like, I'm out of my comfort zone. And I think of that often as a very, very, you know, minor <laughs> um, way to compare what many youth would experience going into a brand new environment. Um, and even, you know, when they go into kinship care, it's a completely different situation that they have to acclimate to. So there can be a lot of impact from that. Um, and how I think that really you know, um, how you, the book that you've written so beautifully um, can really help both situations, whether it's stranger foster care, so to speak, or kinship care, is to give um, an opportunity for people to talk about with children, caregivers to talk about with children, why this has happened and or um, kind of what does it mean for them as it relates to their family context. And so I think that's what's so important is that people are really looking for ways to have conversations with children about why they can't be with their biological parents or their biological families. Um, and this book just did such a beautiful job of making it a pretty 
simple conversation, um, which oftentimes is what we see with kids that we're working with. They don't often need in-depth explanation with a lot of details. And, you know, um, we talk about that a lot with the families that we work with is like, how do I talk to my child about this really big thing that happened? And most of the times kids just need us to name it and give an explanation that makes sense, that feels mm-hmm. like it has you know, a, a truth. Um, sometimes people make up stories to try to explain things and kids know, they know when we're not right. being honest. Right. And they know when we're kind of saying, Oh, you know, well, they went to uh, a vacation or, you know, these silly mm-hmm. things, or we say nothing at all, which leaves the child to come up with their own version of explanation, which is super confusing. And oftentimes they will blame themselves because they're so right. egocentric, right. As young children. And so, um, So I think just saying something is really important, but people are at a loss as to what to say. And this book really gives them the opportunity to say, oh, here's a way that I could explain it that is honest, straightforward, and yet simple enough for the child to digest. And just like in the book, many times we see that once children have that explanation, they go, oh, okay, so what can we do next? And they kind of, (laughs) it's, you know, it really settles down this like angst of like, what is happening? You know, as people were curious and we need to know what's happening in our environment, we're biologically predispositioned to be attuned to what's happening as children so we can survive. And Mm -hmm. so they're going to be looking for information. They're going to be looking for answers and they that attunement is what helps them know when we're not being straightforward and honest about what's going on. Um, and that's what I really love about this book is it just gives some, you know, pretty basic and straightforward conversation information to caregivers. So it doesn't have to feel so overwhelming or confusing for the caregiver to know, what do I say? How do I say it? You know, a lot of times parents get scared of, um, or, you know, caregivers get scared of like, well, what if they ask other questions and I don't know how to answer? Right. Um, and usually I just say, you know, hey, I don't know, actually, I don't know more information than this. This is what I know um, about yeah. why, um, or this is what I know about, you know, what's happened. Um, because right. often I imagine kids- just reflecting that frustration that might show up too, of like, I know this is frustrating for you that I don't have more information to give you could also right. be empowering to kids. Right. Absolutely. And it also helps build the bond and connection between that caregiver and the child, because now the child knows that they can go to that caregiver and they're going to get an answer, um, an answer that's honest and straightforward and makes sense. Um, and yet right. doesn't over, doesn't burden the child by giving too many details or more information. And that's oftentimes the fine line, right? Is how do we give enough information to help settle down whatever the question is that the child is is wondering about, but not burden them by giving additional details that they didn't already need or didn't already have, or don't need to know um, mm-hmm. that then does kind of almost create more anxiety and um, overwhelm. And I think that's what caregivers are oftentimes rightfully so concerned about. Um, how do I just give enough information? Not too much, not too little. Um, and I think this book does a great job of that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I think as mental health professionals, we're always about straightforward conversations. So like, I'm glad that landed in this book the same way because written is different than having these conversations in person with these clients Mm -hmm. and their families. Um, a, a recent book I was looking at for kids kind of same same structure was really vague. And so as you're talking, I'm thinking about that book going, okay, they were like giving a message of your parents still loves you. They're still thinking of you. Like they were trying to, I think, uh, reassure the mm-hmm. child, the reader that like mm-hmm. mom or dad or whoever it was is still like thinking of you and still loves you, even if they're not part of your life. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that kind of messaging in a book or even verbally when it's a yeah. foster parent or kinship person, if that's mm-hmm. a good thing or a bad thing or a neutral thing. Hmm. Yeah, that's really, that is really interesting because sometimes, um, you know, it's, I think all kids want to know that their parents love them. Right. And I Mm -hmm. honestly don't know that I've ever encountered a parent, no matter how complex of a situation it is that doesn't, you know, love their child. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just that sometimes many times in these situations, there's other complications, right. That's right really make it difficult for them to care for that child in a way that shows that love in a healthy way. Um, And I think that's where it can be confusing for kids because it's what we don't want is to, you know, confuse love with abuse or make that an interchangeable, like, 
um, type of messaging. Um, and so I, for me, it, it can be that, um, you know, you, you always have a part of your parent as a child, like they're just a part of you, right. You were birthed by your mother and helped created by your father. And, um, I think it's important for kids to know that, that, that never changes, right. Like they're, this is their, their parent. Um, and that's that sometimes, you know, as parents, and this is true for parents, even who, um, maybe don't engage in abuse or neglect at the level that involves the DHS, but, um, or, you know, need results in the child being removed from the home, but that we all fall short as parents and we all make mistakes and we all say things and do things that likely harm our child, or we can't meet every need in the moment that they need us to meet it. Right. So there's always some element of, um, ways that we may fail as parents, um, or that things that happen that may impact our kids that we can't stop or protect them from. And oftentimes it comes from our own unresolved stuff, our own right. resolved, um, unresolved trauma, or just things that we're not, you know, we, we can't see we're blind to it, um, because of how we were raised and, um, the, you know, limitations of being human <laughs> is yeah. part of it, right? Like we're just not perfect and we're not meant to be. And it's, it's actually not always, it's not always good for our kids. It's not healthy for our kids to think that we are perfect. Um, mm -hmm. that doesn't help them learn how to um, deal with adversity and challenges and difficulties and, um, how to make mistakes and recover from them. So I feel like I've bunny trailed completely off course from what you asked, which was, <laughs> oh, reminding kids that they are loved by their parents. Um, so yes, I think it's important to remind them of that, but also that that doesn't, it can't be an either or like, well, your parent loved you and therefore that's all you need to know. Um, yeah, because, right. I, and I think that's where things, you know, can fall short and leave a lot of questions still for the child and create that ground, um, that, you know, potential for the child to say like, well, if they love me and they did this, is that what people do when mm. they love you? Yeah. Um, and that's the or kind like of messaging a, we don't want. A concrete thinker. I'm thinking of a 12 year old I worked with way back when I was working with children, who was like, I don't want to be like this parent if they had a lens of what abuse and trauma and stuff look like, mm -hmm. which this 12 year old unfortunately did, but also the, if they love me, why aren't they here? Right. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of look like thought pattern for a child of like in hurt and frustration. Great. You keep telling me that they love me, but they're not here. Or they've made a choice. or they're something from addiction. Addiction was winning that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. So I appreciate your insight into how to navigate this in a thoughtful way, because I feel like it could be a messy box to open if the person's mm -hmm. not prepared for the emotional response of a child going, I hear what you're saying. And I still feel frustrated, sad, mm -hmm. angry about the mm -hmm. circumstance of not being with my parent. So well, um, I, I hope, and I hope that every child is validated in that, right? Like they can know that their parent loves them and still be angry mm -hmm. at their parent, right? This is a dynamic in parent child relationships regardless. So um, right, right. it's, yeah. So I think it's, it's, and I, and I hope that as mental health professionals and also any, you know, caregivers that might be um, tuning in that we really understand that as is true for adults, it's true for kids that feelings are complex. Mm -hmm. We feel many things at the same time. It can be that they feel loved by their parent and also hurt by their parent. And both right. of those things are true. Absolutely. So I really value your wisdom on this short little video as people hear more about what you're thinking about and how this book can be one of many resources to have the conversation about parent and child dynamics or, you know, lack of contact, things like that. Where can people find you if they have questions for you? Oh, yeah. Um, so we have uh, three office locations here in Colorado. We're in Centennial, Castle Rock, and Steamboat Springs. Um, mm -hmm. And our website, do you, how do I, should I just say it? Or do you yeah, post and it? I'll put it okay. below as well. Yeah. Okay. Um, it's CWC Colorado, two C's back to back and Colorado spelled out CWCCOLORADO.com. And there's our phone numbers uh, and addresses for all of our locations. Um, but we'd, yeah, we'd love to support anyone um, in Colorado that's looking for more uh, information about this topic or just working with children in general, um, especially children who are involved with the Department of Human Services, child protection, foster care, kinship, right. um, or adoption from foster care. Yeah, oh, such amazing specialties and so needed. For our folks who are watching who are mostly therapists, also know that Christine is an amazing supervisor and consultant if you have questions for her specific to these populations. Christine, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me on. Absolutely. You're stay tuned for more videos. We'll see you next time.